Good evening. evening. Welcome to, there we go, it is working. Okay, good. Welcome to worship this evening. Uh, Just a couple of announcements. Uh, The Board of Elders and uh, Pastor Ganey met recently and uh, have come up with a few uh, different guidelines for worship and use of masks and stuff like that. Um, The biggest is probably that Pastor Ganey and I, uh, while we're up here on the altar, uh, will be unmasked uh, so you can hear us and see us and all of that fun stuff. Plus, him and I are almost a family group anyway. We're around each other all the time, and we're fully vaccinated. So uh, the one exception to that is uh, during the distribution of communion, when you guys are coming forward and taking off your masks, uh, we will... Uh, have ours on. So uh, that is the one time during the service that we'll be both wearing masks. Um, One of the other things is that uh, during the reading of the lessons, during the sermon, uh, we do invite you to to lower your masks at that point, and uh, we've relaxed that a little bit. Um, There were some things in there about seating arrangements. I can't remember the details on that, but... uh, 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 We're trying to get back a little bit more to normalcy, but at the same time, uh, still be safe about everything and and keep everybody's health at the forefront. Um, This weekend uh, marks the 500th anniversary of when Martin Luther stood in front of a meeting of the emperor, the uh, uh, electors, and the princes of Germany, and they put to him the question, uh, do you take back everything that you have written and said uh, about the church or not? And Luther had to make that decision of what he was going to do. And it was pronounced on April 18th, uh, 1521. Uh, He used the words, Uh, Here I stand. And so the Lutheran Church has, uh, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod has designated this weekend as Here I Stand Weekend. And so we'll talk a little bit about that in the message uh, for this evening. Uh, The texts are the regular texts for the third Sunday after uh, Easter, but they do fit well in with that that theme of sticking to the faith and uh, not compromising the faith. So we will talk a little bit about all of that uh, in the message today. So uh, we ask God's blessings upon you as you worship with us, and uh, we begin with our first hymn.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. In your presence there is fullness of joy. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up. O Lord, my God, I cry to you for help, and you have healed me. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Gracious Lord, by your name, you have called us to your own children, and we are to pray, praise, and give thanks to you. Yet, we often choose not to see the love you have given to us, letting other things of this world impede our vision of your mercy and grace in Christ. We do not always live as you have called us to be your children. We confess our sins to God in repentance, turning from those things that lead us away and turning back to you in the love you've shown. Almighty and ever compassionate Lord, we are by nature sinful and unclean. We confess our many failures as you have not followed your joyfully and trustingly. We have not loved you as you have first loved us, and our thoughts, words, and deeds have not been pleasing to you. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us to delight in your will and walk in the ways to the glory of your name. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In your presence there is fullness of joy. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As his children, may he keep you in his grace by the Holy Spirit, and grant you a renewed life on earth, and finally, a triumphant life with him in heaven forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, through the humiliation of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to your faithful people, rescued from the peril of everlasting death, perpetual gladness and eternal joys. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. You may be seated. The first reading appointed for the third Sunday after Easter is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 3. While the lame man who was now healed clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's, astounded. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, that the faith that is in Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers... I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things of which God spoke by mouth of his holy prophets long ago. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from the book of 1 John chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise in honor of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. 
And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate before them. And he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated for the sermon hymn. Grace to you and peace from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. The text for our meditation this evening is from our gospel lesson from Luke chapter 24 where our Lord Jesus says, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem and you are witnesses of these things. This is our text. Dear friends in Jesus Christ, our living Lord and Savior, Christ is risen, alleluia. It all could have ended on that evening of April 18th, 1521. The sun was just beginning to set on the city of Worms. The heat was stifling in that packed room of the bishop's palace where the emperor, the electors, and the German princes all waited 
with anticipation to hear the answer that Martin Luther would bring. Would he recant? Would he retract what he had written and said against the abuses in the church and against the papacy? Most of all, would he give up the gospel that he had preached and taught that had brought comfort and certainty to so many of his hearers? Martin, they commanded, answer clearly and without any double talk. Do you or do you not recant your books and the errors in them? Now, if Luther recanted and admit that he was wrong, all would be well with him and the emperors and the Roman Catholic Church. He'd be a free man. On the other hand, if he did not recant, his very life would be at risk. He could be burned at the stake as a heretic. And so that was it. Recant or stand firm. You can only imagine that with beads of sweat on his face, Luther responded, Unless I am convinced by the testimony of Scripture or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the Scriptures, I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. Amen. At this bold confession, you can imagine that the room erupted into great noise. Some rejoiced along with Martin Luther. Some demanded fire. And yet, in the midst of such commotion, the truth of Jesus Christ rang forth. The gates of Hades had not prevailed over the confession of the gospel. The proclamation of justification by grace by grace, through faith, on account of Christ's work alone, did not bend to spiritual tyranny. Well, it was 500 years ago this weekend that those events took place. And as I said during the announcements, consequently, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod has designated this weekend as Here I Stand weekend for churches across our country. And so today we stand in the footsteps of Martin Luther. We stand boldly proclaiming the one who has called us out of his darkness into his marvelous light. And we stand boldly renouncing the devil and all of his works and all of his ways. We stand by the grace of God, steadfast and ready to suffer all rather than fall away. We do not stand on Luther, but we will gladly stand with him, firm on the testimony of the Holy Scriptures to confess the saving gospel of Christ, our Good Shepherd, who died and rose, and whose name is all forgiveness for all people. Here we stand we can do no other. God help us. Amen. No, sorry. That's not the end of the message. In our gospel lesson for today, Jesus appears before his disciples that very first Easter evening. In Luke's gospel, the women went out to the tomb to find it empty and to hear the angel's message, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, he is risen. 
Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered to the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Luke also tells us of Peter running out to the tomb where he also sees the empty tomb, but there is no mention in Luke that Peter was ever confronted by an angel, as other Gospels tell us. And it is only in Luke that we are given the account of the two disciples on that road to Emmaus. They walk with Jesus as he explains the scriptures to them. And as they persuade him to have dinner with them, it is when he is breaking the bread that he is revealed to them. And once the disciples realize that it's Jesus, they run back to Jerusalem to tell the other disciples that they have seen the Lord. And as those amazed disciples are telling their story to the other disciples. That's when Jesus suddenly appears to them all. And again, this is Easter evening. They are still trying to figure out everything that's happened. And so when Jesus appears to them, he says, Peace to you. But they are startled and frightened until they saw a spirit. And with the worry that the religious leaders might be coming after them just like they came after Jesus. And with that deep sense of loss at the the death of their Lord and Savior, you know, they feel a bit like Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms 500 years ago, fearing for his life. The disciples didn't know if the religious leaders were coming after them. They didn't know if their lives were on the line. They didn't know if they were in danger of being next to hang on the cross like their precious Lord and Savior. And so when Jesus stands before them, even after hearing the message from the angels at the tomb earlier given to the women, And even with the report of the Jesus sighting by the Emmaus disciples, they are still startled and frightened and thought they had seen a spirit. But Jesus goes on to explain to them what he had been telling them all along, that these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. That was Jesus' message to his disciples that first Easter evening. And that continues to be our message 2,000 years after the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and it is the same message we proclaim 500 years after Martin Luther stood in front of the emperor and the electors and all those German princes. Scripture tells us that God is the same yesterday and today and forever, and so is his word. And so is his message. Luther's writings and teachings were an attempt to get back to the preaching and teaching of the pure gospel, that we are saved by the grace of God through faith and not by anything that we have done, because Jesus has done it all according to God's plan. 
Unfortunately, the world still tries to stifle that message. The devil tries his best to suppress and distort that message. Even people around us try to lead us away from our Savior. Everywhere we turn, there are, gosp- there are obstacles to the grace of God and his loving forgiveness of our sins. But through it all, we have God's promise that his Holy Spirit will be with us and that God's word will always remain supreme. And it's not just out there where these things happen, but the world and Satan and people around us try to undermine the gospel in our own very personal lives every single day. It is a true and it is a real attack on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and on the gospel that he has given us. But all the way back in Psalm 19, our Lord gives us some very real hope, some very real comfort. In Psalm 19, David writes, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The laws of the Lord are true, and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. My dear friends, as we stand at this 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's great confession and his refusal to compromise the gospel and the precious gifts that God gives to us in that gospel message. Let us, along with Martin Luther and the disciples in that upper room, the night that Jesus appeared to them after his resurrection, that first Easter morning, Always keep God's word at the forefront of our lives. Let us keep the gospel and its message pure in our message to others. And let us always keep the gospel near and dear to our hearts. Let's read it. Let's listen to it. And as Mary, the mother of our Lord, did, let us treasure up all these things and ponder them in our hearts. The gospel, and only the gospel, can change us. It renews us, it strengthens us through the power of the Holy Spirit working in that word. Martin Luther knew one thing, that God's word had to be number one in our lives. We cannot retract it or or take it back. We cannot hide it. We cannot change it. Because we are his witnesses. We are witnesses of the resurrection. We are witnesses of the gospel. And so we need to proclaim that word so that it can change not only our lives, but the lives of the people around us. And so we need to proclaim that word to the world so that the world also can be changed, so that they know the salvation of our God. We also often forget that there is strength in the word of God, that there is power in the word of God. 
power to forgive sins, and power to offer and grant eternal life. May we always depend on this power. And may we always respond to God's word as Martin Luther did. Here I stand. May God help me. Amen. May the peace of God, which far surpasses all of our human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, now and forevermore. Amen. We join together in confessing our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence we will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their need. Lord God, in your presence we find fullness of joy. And by your right hand, Christ Jesus, you win and deliver peace forevermore. In the midst of this world's sin and sorrows, give us peace in the knowledge of his salvation and confident hope in the resurrection of the dead. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for your servant, Martin Luther, through whom the Christian church was called back to the truth of the scriptures and the comfort of the gospel for repentant conscience found in Christ alone. By your Holy Spirit and the conviction of the blessed scriptures, embolden us to confess faithfully in our time the death and resurrection of Christ for the forgiveness of sins and to stand unashamed on the prophetic and apostolic scriptures in the face of all opposition or discomfort. Give wisdom and zeal to our preachers. Give resolve and confidence to all Christians and preserve the witness to Christ's resurrection that all consciences may be bound up by his forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy, Give peace, Lord, to our homes and enliven them by Christ's resurrected life. Let the forgiveness of sin reign among husband and wife, parent and child. Assure those who live alone that they too are your children, upheld by your right hand. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, preserve our nation and its leaders especially our president and governor, preserve order and decency in this fallen world by their hands and restrain the sin and deception of the lawless, that we may practice righteousness while awaiting the eternal peace promised in Christ's wounds alone. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Gracious Father, as your son's wounds brought gladness and peace, to the troubled disciples. Give your presence and comfort to the troubled and ill in our midst. We pray especially for Jim Von Dissen, Keith Mertens, Krista Parker, Vivian Fickner, Ken and Clint Fick, Kim Weber, Lola Hargrove, Marty Berger, John Pollock, Bob Lovedall, Myrna Hoover, Ron Benson, Sean Scanlon, Jean Howe, 
Jim Palmer, Ron Vivian, Luke and Micah Flick, and Tyler Zelko. Comfort those who mourn with the blessed joy of Easter morning, Lord, in your mercy. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by your Son's crucifixion, all sins have been blotted out. Send us now the blessed refreshment of his bodily presence in the altar, sacrament of the altar, and make us fit partakers in the repentance for forgiveness of our sins. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you would have us know, Grant us, Heavenly Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen.